Lucy and I are going to do the presentation together, so you'll be seeing us switch back and forth a little bit. I'm going to start just by outlining a bit the objectives for today. Um, we will start with a little bit of a quick review about what is Parkinson's. I mean, we understand that most of you here have a pretty good understanding of that already, but just to make sure we all have the terminology more or less on an equal field. Then we're going to define pain. What is pain? What are the different types of pain? How are they experienced? And what the heck exactly is Parkinson's pain? Then we want to look at um, different pharmacologic strategies for reducing pain, so pharmacologic meaning medications mainly. We won't be spending too much time talking about any particular drug. It's more the idea of the different types of medications and things that can be used. Um, and then we're going to talk also about the non-pharmacologic, so complementary and alternative ways of addressing the pain. And just before we conclude, we'll talk a little bit about the impact of pain in people living with Parkinson's. Good. You hear me well? That's good. I, I don't think we need to adjust the microphone between the two of us. That's good. <laughs> So all the words are important. The slide here, you need to know that, of course, just to summarize Parkinson, it's a progressive, that means it progress with time. Neurological, neurological disease, neurodegenerative, so the, the cells in the brain deplete with time. And it's caused, again, by the depletion of the dopamine cells in the substantia nigra. The substantia nigra is a little zone in deep inside the brain, not bigger than an almond, where it's all contained the dopamine, okay? It's characterized by four things, okay? And the acronym for those four things are TRAP. T for tremor, R for rigidity, A for akinesia. In this presentation, we, we talk more about bradykinesia. Bradykinesia is the slowness of the movement. Akinesia is the absence of movement. Of course, in Parkinson, we talk more about slowness in the movement. And P for posture, so change in the posture with time. Okay, so the TRAP is the acronym. These are the motor symptoms of Parkinson. This is what your doctor, neurologist, or your GP evaluate when he sees you in a clinic. This was first described by James Parkinson in 1817. So we've we'll talked about Parkinson for a very long time. And it was called back then a essay on shaking palsy. If you Google, you will see what it looks like on the computer. A little bit of epidemiology, the quick stats. Right now in the country, there is about, well, more, a little bit more than 100,000 population in the country. 1% of the population is diagnosed before the age of 65, and it goes up to 2% after 75 years old. Now, if I would like you to remember, of course, everything we're going to say about pain today, but the third point, about 5 to 10% of patients are diagnosed before the age of 40. This is very important to me because it gives another uh, flavor about Parkinson. It's no longer, please think about that, it's no longer a senior disease. It's affecting young people. And when I'm in clinic and I have a mother of kids, young children that is my age, it affects me as well, you know, because it could be me. It could really be me having Parkinson. So you need to know that it's no longer a senior disorder. Male are slightly more affected than female. We don't know exactly why is that. There's a lot of research there. And it's more prevalent in North America, in Europe, than it is in Asia or Africa. Of course, it's everywhere. We've been to the World Parkinson Congress in Portland. There was 67 different countries represented by many, many people. So Parkinson disease is worldwide, okay? Americans, 5.5 million with about 60,000 new cases diagnosed every year. So it's a lot of people. And of course, it tends to grow with aging of the population. Now, of course, today the goal is not to tell you all about the Parkinson medication, but you know, you've, you're probably, so for the people affected with the Parkinson, you know the different class of medication. So just to summarize, the iceberg is a famous image we use all the time in our, con on our conference. 
The top of the iceberg are the movement, I'm sorry, the motor symptoms of Parkinson. The trap I was telling you about, tremor, rigidity, akinesia, bradykinesia, and P for posture. So everything on surface of water are the motor symptoms. Everything under surface of water, which is always bigger, are the non-motor symptoms. Everything, all the problem about the sleep, the depression, the mood swings, constipation, digestion with problem digestion, and of course the pain. So we're going to tell you what, is this, what it is all about in a few minutes. Okay? So what is pain? That's the famous question. And when I was looking to find an actual definition for pain, there are so many. And it really, really supports the idea that pain is such a very individual experience that you can't necessarily have one definition that will fit all. So the best I could do is to say that in medicine, pain relates to sensation that hurts. You're uncomfortable. And again, the individuality of it can change very much, and it can only be described by the person who's experiencing it. It's very hard for one person to understand exactly what that sensation of pain feels like to somebody else. It also makes it very difficult for that person to describe it effectively to their healthcare providers mm -hmm. to help us try and help you. And I included this little quote. I'm going to read it because I'm not sure if you can actually uh, make it out. It says, my pain has been mainly neurological. I describe it as like shaking a bottle of fizzy water and keeping the cap on. And it just, that description, I think, just supports what I was saying about everybody describes it differently. There's different types of pain. The first type of pain that most people know very well is acute pain. So acute pain is usually very intense, but relatively short-lived, meaning you know six months or less. And it usually responds very well to different types of pain medication. So whether it be a Tylenol, Advil, maybe something stronger. Also, acute pain is usually the result of an injury. So whether you've fallen and sprained your ankle, that pain is going to be intense, it's going to be present, you know exactly why it's there, and you know that it's going to have a duration of time. It's not, you know, infinite. Mm -hmm. Another example of acute pain is incisional pain. So after a surgery, you would expect to have pain at the incision site. So that's basically acute pain. We're not going to be talking too much about acute pain in, in Parkinson's because we tend to see more the chronic pain. So chronic pain is the opposite of acute. It's a pain that is being experienced by someone that's lasting for a period of longer than six months, usually much longer. Um, often the cause is not known. It can become difficult to try and isolate the exact reason why this pain is existing. And it can also be very mild. It could be sort of like a nagging, dull ache that's just constantly there. Or it can come in waves of intense, intense pain that then dissipates and then comes back again. Examples of chronic pain would include joint pain from arthritis, Parkinson's pain, chronic back pain, old sports injury that keeps acting up. So you can see how all of these things can be mixed together and make it really difficult to, to figure out exactly what the cause is. The cycle of chronic pain is vicious. The problem with it is that when someone is experiencing increased pain, usually there's a certain amount of anxiety that goes along with it. Anxiety about what is this pain from? Is there something wrong? Will my pain ever be controlled? Is it gonna affect my ability to keep working? How am I gonna play with my grandchildren if I can't get out of the chair because my back hurts? All of that anxiety then adds up and tends to make sleeping more difficult. We all have had periods in our lives where we don't sleep well. When we don't sleep well, we don't cope well. If you're not coping well, tolerating pain gets even tougher to do. So it's this constant cycle that just turns around. And so we really want to try and be able to relieve this pain so that this cycle can stop. There's many factors that affect how someone experiences pain. One of them uh, is gender. Now, I say the research here tells us that um, apparently in animal models, those animals that have higher levels of testosterone tend to have a higher pain threshold, and that animals with higher estrogen, meaning women, have a lower pain threshold. Personally, I think that's debatable. <laughs> we, we give birth, so I don't know, but we'll leave that open to a discussion, but there, there was a study that showed it, so I figured I'd put it there anyways and let you decide for yourselves. <laughs> Another factor is family. So basically, how you were brought up will affect how you experience pain. 
If when you were a child, you stumbled and fell, banged your knee, crying, crying, and your mom or dad would come over and say, oh, it's okay, it's gonna be okay, we're gonna put some water, some ice, it's not gonna hurt for long, come on, it's, let's go, it's okay to hurt, but it's gonna be okay. You will then experience pain as an adult in a different way than if you were raised in a family with a very stiff upper lip that if you had that fall and had that bobo, you were told, no, 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 there's no pain, don't worry about it, just let's keep going. So you see how that can mold your experiences as you become an adult. Culture and ethnicity play a big part as well, and a lot of that is you know, overlapping with family, but there's also the part where in Western um, explanations and treatments for pain, we really seek more traditional medication, you know, physical therapy, things like that, whereas in Eastern and Native American systems, they tend to be more open in looking at other more spiritual and emotional types of healing and pain. So how they will cope with pain and, and manage it will be influenced differently as well. And we need to remember that. There's different factors that influence pain that Lucy is now. Yes. Age. Okay. Age is main one. Um, and it, in regards to musculoskeletal, MSK is musculoskeletal pain. Of course, as we go older in life, we are perhaps having arthritis, stiff neck, stiff this, regardless of Parkinson. You know, aging is making us more, more prone to have some occasional pain. Depression, there's a strong link in the studies about depression and pain. Of course, if everything is going well, I'm uplifted, my mood is good, Perhaps my knee pain won't be on my, the front burner. If I'm down, the contrary, if I'm down, if I'm sad, if I have other issues, if I'm concerned about my children, there's something bad in life, yes, I'm probably gonna focus more on my knee pain, okay? So there's a strong link. Stress, sleep, and anxiety, it's all linked with the pain as well. It can influence terribly the pain uh, that we have. Previous pain experience. Again, Jennifer was giving us the example of incision. If you have had a surgery way back and you remember to have had a good control of the pain level or not so good control of the pain level, this will influence what it is that you feel or you apprehend about pain in today in Parkinson. And your pain threshold. Of course, everybody has a different threshold of pain. What is Parkinson pain? It's a non-motor symptoms. Remember at the beginning, the iceberg, it's, it's under the surface of water. It's really a non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So it really is true. There is such a thing as Parkinson and pain. Some people say pain is always related to other issue. It's no longer true, okay? Experienced by many people with Parkinson, but not by everyone. 30 to 50% of the population complain about pain. In fact, there's not a day that we do not get a call or few of the calls about pain, about constipation, about all other things, but pain is really much on the front burner again. There truly is a lack of standardized tool. What is it out there to help you to be a little bit more specific about the pain when you will talk to us about it? And if I reverse the situation, what is it out there for us to be able to assess your pain level as best as we can? There is uh, definitely a lack of standardized, to standardized tool. And of course, Jennifer was saying at first, there, it's difficult to explain the pain, you know, to find the right word. We will uh, teach you if possible today about how to be a little bit more specific. Is it you, my friend? It's still me? Okay. <laughs> the type of pain, what exactly is Parkinson pain? The type of pain carry on on the previous slide, its location varies from person to person. And because there is many reasons for pain, you may experience pain in a different way. We need help, you need help to determine what, what is the pain associated with Parkinson or with uh, something else, another condition so, such as arthritis. Parkinson pain is experienced in many different ways again. So the first specific pain about Parkinson is what we call the dystonia related pain. It's a sustained twisting. The image is good, you know, it's a sustained twisting 
of a posturing of a muscle group, a body part could be the arm, could be the thighs, you know, the, the hands, even the feet, that is very much painful and that the person experienced the pain. Dystonia can be both caused by the effect, uh, we didn't go specific about the Parkinson medication, but I'm sure you're familiar with levodopa, levodopa carbidopa, or levodopa benzazide, the cinemet or the prolopa. So whether this levodopa is too strong or not enough, you could have an off period, you know, when your medication wears off, you know, if I'm doing it on your side, if the medication wearing off, and all of a sudden you do not have enough medication, your symptoms of Parkinson return, you could, it could bring, I wanna you know, demonstrate, it could bring some dystonia, some twisting of a limb or a leg or the ankle twisting, okay? Could be on a high dose of Parkinson. Let's say we're giving you a little too much at one time and then again it could cause some dystonia. More rarely, the last dot here, more rarely dystonia in Parkinson is not actually the effect of the levodopa, but by the condition itself, okay? That's important. So the second type of pain that we see often in Parkinson's is called musculoskeletal pain, and that includes mus muscle cramps, so little cramps that you get, not the sustained dystonia that Lucy was mentioning. This is probably the most common type of pain experienced by people with Parkinson's and just the most common type of pain experienced by people in general. Uh, it's usually a discomfort in muscles and joints. Uh, in Parkinson's, it can usually be secondary to the motor features. So when you're off or when you're not feeling well, if you're feeling quite rigid, that rigidity can sometimes be painful. Um, also, if your posture isn't so great, so if you're constantly leaning to one side, well, the muscles on the other side of your back are constantly being stretched and pulled, so that's going to cause pain over time. The most commonly affected areas are usually uh, the back, the legs, and the shoulders. You know, when you have trouble trying to get the coat on and it hurts, it's that rigidity that's causing that pain tends to be more localized than some other types of pains, and it usually will get worse with movement. It feels like um, an aching or stiffness that you can have throughout the body. And if ever you've gone to work out at the gym and maybe, you know, tried to do a little too much, lifted a little too heavy of weights, that feeling you have the next day when your muscles are really achy, that is a typical, typical example of what musculoskeletal pain is. Another type of pain in Parkinson's is called akathitic pain. And if you remember what Lucy mentioned earlier, the anagram trap, so the T for tremor, uh, R for rigidity, A for akinesia, bradykinesia, akinesia meaning lack of movement, akathitic pain is pain caused by immobility in the sense that uh, it's experienced as a restlessness. So this subjective inner urge to move or an inability to sit still. Um, the best example of this type of pain is restless legs syndrome. And it's not always necessarily that it's a sharp, intense pain. It's more of a general discomfort. So people can describe it as feeling um, almost like ants walking on the skin or this uncomfortable sensation in their legs that doesn't get described by burning or stabbing. It's just you need to move. When you move, the pain is relieved. However, this tends to occur mostly at night, and unlike this cartoon, you can't detach your legs and let them walk while you try to sleep. So it has a really, really uh, strong impact in the level of sleep. Again, thinking back to the cycle of chronic pain, we know when you're not sleeping, things are getting worse. So again, vicious cycle. Neuropathic pain, sorry. Uh, is another type of pain, again, experienced in Parkinson's. It's usually experienced as a numbness, tingling, heat, or even an intense sensation of cold that can be felt in the body. Uh, in Parkinson's patients, uh, a strong and prolonged muscle spasm or injured nerves can cause faulty messages to be sent to the body, to the muscles, to give that sensation of pain. So it's not that there's injury or a problem in the muscles, but it's faulty wiring, if you will. 
it can be caused by Parkinson's. It can also be caused by other changes that occur with age. So degenerative disc disease, which is a fancy way of saying as you age, those little cushions between your vertebra and your spine, they lose a little bit of fluid and the donut turns into a flat tire. So you don't have as much cushioning anymore. And that can cause those little nerves that are exiting the spine to be pinched. A good example of this type of pain, and we see it quite often mm -hmm. um, with our patients, is a sciatica type pain where you get that burning that goes down the buttock into the leg. That's an example um, of neuropathic pain. Let's get around. <laughs> Central pain. This is a type of pain that we don't have that much experience with, to be honest with you. Uh, it's probably the most alarming pain syndrome in patients with Parkinson, but it's also one of the rarest, which is probably why we don't know too much about it. This pain, which is presumed to be a direct consequence of the Parkinson's disease itself, is not the result of dystonia or the result of musculoskeletal pain, poor posture. There's really no other cause than the Parkinson's. It's not fully understood why, and it's very difficult to treat. People describe it as bizarre, unexplained feelings, and it could feel like stabbing, burning, scalding, it tends to travel around the body, and it's often presented in unusual places. So whereas we heard with musculoskeletal, it's often the shoulders, the back, the legs, this you're gonna have more the abdomen, the chest, the mouth, the rectum, or even the genitalia can be extremely uncomfortable, and the pain can be relentless. So how do you know it's Parkinson's pain or not? So that's hopefully what we're here to help you with today. And we're gonna get into a little bit more detail in how to assess and what you can do to help with the pain. But it can be helpful sometimes to self-reflect and ask yourself some questions even before you pick up the phone. One of the first things you can ask yourself is, is this new? Is this a new pain? Have I ever had this pain before? Sometimes we can forget, but if your leg all of a sudden starts hurting and you reflect back and you think, oh, I remember you know, that skiing accident 20 years ago. It was the same place that it hurt. It may be relevant, it may be not, but it's worth mentioning when you would call. Um, have you ever had surgery in that area before? Are you known to have back problems or arthritis? Another question to ask yourself, if you find question number one difficult, Number two, have I ever gone to see a doctor or somebody about this pain before? That might help sometimes to ring the bell and say, oh yes, I did, and I don't remember, or it went away, but I'm not sure what it was. But again there, it helps to see that maybe there is a pattern that you've had this type of pain before. And then to ask yourself, could this be an age-related thing more than just my Parkinson's? Again, it doesn't mean it's not gonna be addressed and treated, but it just may help when we're trying to streamline as to what the cause is. Good, so at this point, what we want to do is help you to help us, to help you with the pain afterward. Is that making sense? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to bring some, we want you to bring us some accurate information. Jennifer is asking you to reflect about your pain. So now, what is it that we want to do is helping you to put down on a piece of paper. Because you know what, when you come to see the doctor in a clinic, sometimes we feel very rushed. Patients feel rushed, you know, you see the doctor is a little tense, so you don't have your, your, your moment of glory with the doctor it doesn't last very long, let's say. So you need to be prepared. I, I can't, we cannot emphasize enough that you need to be prepared when you go see the doctor, especially for a problem regarding pain. So it will help us to direct which angle. You know, we talk about the different kind of pains. So it will, it will help us. So one way you, we will ask you about the pain and one way you can reflect up front now that you will have heard this presentation is PQRST. It's a very straightforward little... Uh, uh, anagram. An, an, anagram, thank you. Welcome. For, <laughs> for helping you to reflect on your pain. So P is for provoking, provoking factors. So what caused the pain? Have you noticed that what, for instance, when you're doing the specific activity, the pain comes? And have you noticed when you stop doing that whatever activity, the pain goes away? Do you notice when it wears off? Is it linked again with the wearing off of your medication? The quality of the pain. What does it feel like? Again, all these words are important to us. Is it the burning, stabbing, electrical shocks? You know, this will direct once again our thinking about what kind of what what kind of pain is that. 
region for region and radiation of the pain. Where the pain is in your body. What, is it a, a strange, you know, is it the arm, the shoulder, or again, it's the, the stomach, the chest, the genitala. Um, and we heard the genitala pain uh, not so long ago, right? S, the severity of the pain. And you've probably seen that scale before on a scale of one to 10. When it, the pain is at the worst, what number is that? And when it's at the best, what number is it? Okay, so we reflect on the pain again in terms of the severity of the pain. The timing of the pain. Again, for us, the T is very important. Again and again, I will emphasize on that, is the pain there when you wear off. And that will trigger our adjustment for our Parkinson medication. Okay, so is it worse at a certain time? Is it always in the afternoon or it's when you wake up in the morning? So that's we, um, all the question you need to ask yourself ahead and at home when you relax and you will tell the physician when you come in clinic. So why is it important to be so detailed? Well, it's optimal for pain management because the what we're trying to achieve here is trying to get rid of that pain, okay? So we want to be a specific. So and the, the example, the picture about the link, the, the fix a leak, you can't fix a leak until you know where it's coming from. Even if we put some tape on this leak, it's not going to hold, okay? So we want to know what it is that we're dealing with. I told you up front there was not a lot of tools, but there is now a few tools that have come out. This is the King Parkinson Pain Quest for questionnaire, and it's been done in the UK by the team, the movement disorder team by Ray Shaduri, is a very knowledgeable neurologist in the Parkinson field. And probably you can't, you can't read the question, but it's a yes and no answer. And frankly, this tool, we're probably gonna try and pilot it ourselves in the clinic, this could be completed when you sit in the waiting room to prompt the discussion with the physician or with us afterward. So for instance, that question number one, pain around the joint, including pain related to arthritis, yes or no? Number four, non-specific pain deep within the body, generalized, constant, dull, aching, yes or no? Uh, generalized pain during off period, pain in the whole body or areas that are not affected by muscle group, yes or no. So you can tell it's going to ask, what is it, 14 questions about different, to cover the, the region of the pain, the different type of pain that we discussed before. So that will help us, okay? Is it still me? Nope. No, it's you. My, my turn, <laughs> we like to share. We're switching. <laughs> So now that we've hopefully given you some tools to help um, get better at maybe reporting and defining your pain, what are we going to do about it? So there's different strategies that can be put in place to help manage pain in Parkinson's once we've identified the type of pain that is being experienced. Um, it's unlikely though that one treatment will relieve pain. Just like pain itself is complex, often the treatment will be complex as well requires sometimes a lot of time, a lot of trial and error, and a lot of patience. Contributing factors can also make pain relief more difficult. For example, uh, what might work one day might not work as well the next day if you haven't slept well, you're feeling a little more tired or a little more stressed, um, because we know things like fatigue can significantly impact your, your perception of pain. For optimal pain control, an interdisciplinary model of care is important, it's ideal. Um, what we mean by interdisciplinary is that it may not be just the neurologist, it may be the neurologist plus your family doctor plus the nurse. Maybe there's a physical therapist that's in there helping with some stretching as well. Maybe you go for massages regularly to help with the muscle tension. So really it's, it's good to try and look at having a team address your pain. And Finally, it's usually a combination of both traditional pharmacological approaches and complementary strategies that usually will offer the best control. So now we'll talk about the two different types of strategies. So pharmacologic just basically means medication, anything a doctor can prescribe to you to help relieve the pain. So medications, which we'll go into a little bit more specifically, we're going to, you know, uh, break down a little bit more what can be done for different types of pain. 
um, but things like the Advil, the Tylenols that we mentioned before. Um, there's injections that can be done, whether it's Botox into a muscle or nerve blocks into the, you know, the degeneration uh, of the discs. There's topical anesthetics, so if you have musculoskeletal pain, you can rub creams on there, ointments. And then there's the non-pharmacologic. I just want to clarify a little bit because we sometimes hear alternative therapies, sometimes we hear complementary therapies. What's the difference? Are they the same thing? So essentially they are the same thing. The word alternative is used when people are opting to use only that type of therapy. So they're not using any traditional medication, they're choosing only alternative therapies. We call it complementary therapies mm -hmm. if they're using a combination of both. So I might switch back and forth sometimes, but essentially it's the same thing. There's many, many different non-pharmacologic approaches. We're not going to address them all uh, in this talk. I'm not an expert on all of them, but the idea today is just to raise a bit of awareness that there might be things out there that you may not have been aware of. So for managing pain that's associated with dystonia, now we're going to go specifically into the different types of pains we talked about earlier and let you know the different things that you could try or speak to your healthcare um, provider about. So remembering that the dystonia can happen when you're having wearing off of medication. If we look at this little graph that's here, um, the light, the blue that's below the line, this is when you're not feeling well, when you're off. That's when the dystonia could set in. You take your medication, the symptoms start to go away, you're feeling a little bit better, but then as the medications are wearing off, you get a fading effect and the dystonia can come back. Take another level carb, the pain starts to go away. So it's this constant wave that goes up and down. By looking at that schedule and marking down the times that you experience the dystonia, it can help us in knowing, is this something that's going to be treated by adjusting your medication? Do we need to change the timing? Do we need to change the dose? If the med changes don't help, there's other medications that can help dystonia. Um, examples are drugs that can be considered muscle relax relaxants, things like clonazepam or baclofen. These are very strong medications to help relax the muscles. Unfortunately, they come along with some hefty side effects too. A lot of them can make you quite fatigued or somnolent, and so they're not I, I, they're not used that that often. Um, and then another alternative, if there's a sustained dystonia, is Botox. We don't just use it for wrinkles, we use it for dystonia too. So when you have a, a muscle that's staying cramped, if they inject a little bit of Botox, it can actually relax um, the muscle and it can be effective for up to three months. Mm -hmm. Again, just repeating what we said, to add on to the dystonia as well is that physical therapy can be really helpful as a supplement. Working with a therapist to help stretching and elongating the muscles because they tend to always want to go back to that position. And basically, many patients also report benefits from doing activities such as yoga, tai chi, meditation, which we will talk again a little bit more in detail. But just to say, it's not a one shoe fits all. It really is a matter of trial and error. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. So we're back to the musculoskeletal pain. So you remember that pain comes from rigidity, you know, the R and the trap, the rigidity, the stiffness that comes. So, of course, we can use what is out there in the drugstore, the non stereotypical anti-inflammatories that and said, such as ibuprofen, naprosyn. You always need to ask the pharmacist about these drugs. You never know. It could be not good for you. It's if you have other health concerns, you're taking a lot of medication, they will make sure you, have a, you don't have a red flag that it's contra contraindicated with your other medication. The same thing goes for um, acetaminophen, because acetaminophen, we put the four grams per 24 hours, but depending on your health condition, it might be a maximum of two grams per 24 hours. So again, it varies from one person to person. If you have blood pressure, if you have stomach ulcer, you might be a little bit more limited. Topical analgesic, ointment, cream, I mean, we've mentioned that. And of course, there we might try to adjust the medication of Parkinson, but if it, that doesn't work, we will go there, having those medication involved. Uh, other treatment, you know, the complementary strategy we could use, such as physical and occupational therapy. We don't acknowledge them enough in our team because uh, these guys are phenomenal in terms of assessing 
what is the problem, the posture, and so on and so forth. So they get good advice, good tips when someone has, has pain. Using eat or cold, you'll see with Jennifer later what is the rationale with eat or cold. Uh, but you can trial and error. You can try something. If it doesn't work, you go, you try something else. Reducing the workload. If you put too much on your to-do list in one day, perhaps the following day you won't do as much and that will help, just that will help you relieve your pain. Uh, reducing the stress. You know, the stress, the relaxation will help. Biofeedback techniques, acupuncture, acupressure. Uh, Jennifer will go over that in a few slides strengthening you know if you have a, you know I can speak for myself I had a back problem and I started to exercise and guess what since then my back problem is gone because you develop core strain and you feel better so I can speak about that <laughs> uh, conditioning exercise stretching you know you need to understand that you're fighting this Parkinson disease which is a movement disorder by keeping moving you need to be in action. You need to be in movement. And therapeutic massage. A cathetic pain. Remember these legs working all by themselves overnight? So the restless leg syndrome. Of course, we can tell up front the person will know by themselves I'm going to get up and the sensation will go away. But at night, we can't say that. So if we have a restless leg syndrome, we are using one class of medication, which are, which are the dopamine agonists. This is very helpful, especially even just one dose at night to help with the sensation of those little hands crawling under the skin. So that, that helps. But Premipexol is one, the Mirapex, just to name a few. Rotigotin is the Nurpro, it's a patch. Ropinerol, Requip. Uh, but again, they come with side effects, right? So you need to always consider pros and cons in that. And some of those side effects are sleepless, sleep, sleepiness, nausea, and that can happen during the day. Light headedness and so on and so forth. We will, of course, adjust the levodopa. That might help at night and during the day to help with the, those little crazy legs. And massage, exercise, and cool shower will help as well. The neuropathic pain, you know, like the, uh, we mentioned the uh, sciatica, you know, that's the most common example. Gabapentin is strangely an anti-convulsant, convulsant medication, but it affects different chemicals in the brain and nerves that involves, uh, that are caused with seizures. So we give that for seizure purposes, but it also have pain relief effect that has been known for years now. Pregabalin is the same thing. It's another convulsant. So you may be surprised sometimes to, to hear that the pharmacist is telling you the category of drug you're taking, and for you, it's given for the pain. So we, we should not be afraid of these medica medication. The same thing for the tricyclic antidepressant. Guess what? We could perhaps prescribe an antidepressant for a pain problem because, for instance, this one, amitriptyline, has a pain killing effect mechanism and it could also of course have a boosting effect in terms of your mood so if you're in between you know sad depressed anxious amitript and you have pain amitriptyline might be a good a good medication that might be prescribed by your healthcare providers and again the rationale for the uh, amitriptyline to work is that it will increase the, it may increase the neurotransmitter effect in the spinal cord and send the good message to your, to your brain that the, the signal of the pain is, is reduced. It's not right away. It's not after one pill that you're going to feel the benefits of that pill. It's going to take four, six weeks. So we, we ask often patient to be patient in the, the pain control. The other slide is coming, yes. <laughs> uh, the central pain. So the central pain can be modified by the dopaminergic medication. Of course, we're going to try to adjust the pain medication. If that doesn't work, again, we will use other medication, analgesic, opioids, antidepressant, as I just discussed about that. And we definitely will refer to pain clinic management for complex pain. Um, some of you may have been referred to pain clinic and some of you may have come back from pain clinic being disappointed. And the reason behind is 
they will see and they first of all they have we need to tell that they have a very long waiting list but if you have with your neurologist some benefits and we have tried a few things and it's the pain is gone but it's not gone totally it's you know it's like putting a band-aid on a bobo is always there the pain we don't know why but the pain is there they may not want to see you right away because they will put the priority on patients that have pain that is not help with anything okay so the pain clinic are restricting a bit their their, their patient um, and the complementary therapies again has relaxation meditation guided imaging that's it voila jennifer will talk about the alternatives we're getting good at this switching yes. thing <laughs> so now uh, we'll talk a little bit about the alternative therapies these are the ones i'm going to address briefly uh, as i mentioned earlier there's many many more and maybe some of you have things that you'll uh, mention to us later in the question period that maybe you've tried and you can share with us so one of them is heat and cold, there's relaxation and guided imagery, simple distraction, massage, yoga, physical therapy and exercise, acupuncture, herbal remedies, and psychotherapy. So to look at heat and cold first, Generally, when you have more of an acute type of pain, so you, you know, uh, you have an injury, you've tripped and you've rolled your ankle, typically the thought is to put cold on it. A cold compress will help to restrict blood vessels, reduce swelling, and it's the swelling of tissues that causes the pain. Uh, and it helps to dull, dull a little bit the nerve endings as well, momentarily. Um, heat is better for stiff, achy joints, such from arthritis uh, or tired muscles, things like that. However, when I was looking through the research to find what to tell you is the best for each, there were some conflicting um, evidence. So I think essentially in something like heat and cold, you do what works for you. You do what feels good. If you have a stiff, achy joint and putting ice on it makes it feel better, by all means, do the ice. It doesn't matter what somebody's saying ice is supposed to be used for. Um, and a lot of people actually find mm -hmm. benefit from alternating between both heat and cold. The trick here is to be sure that you're never putting any ice or heat on your skin for more than 20 minutes at a time. You don't want to end up with a secondary burn or frostbite because you're trying to get rid of some other kind of pain. So trial and error, do what works best for you. What works one day may not work the next. The idea is to alternate and it can be done multiple times during the day because there's no medication involved. Relaxation and guided imagery. It's a little bit more challenging I've actually tried this on my own just to see, mm -hmm. can it be done? Can I do it? Uh, it's challenging. So it works very well, but it's a learned process. So um, guided imagery is where you have, you can do it in a class or it can be done by listening to CDs. You can go on YouTube and find videos to do mm -hmm. it where basically there's soothing music and there's a nice calm voice telling you that it's going to be okay <laughs> and guiding you away, telling you to concentrate really on your breathing. So it's, it's really taking you away from the pain and bringing you in the moment. It's challenging in the lives that we live. To do that so that's why I say it's it's worth trying but it may you may try and try again try again <laughs> but definitely and it's I mean you can find these videos for free on YouTube it's worth trying um, you can also get DVDs and books if you want to be consistent with the same uh, mm -hmm. same one and you may find one person you like mm -hmm. another one that's maybe not as engaging for you distraction the art of distraction easiest thing to do mm -hmm. Basically, when you're experiencing pain, if you can identify an activity that you can do during that time that will help to distract you, take your mind off the fact that you're having pain. Obviously, I wouldn't suggest making it housework because we don't enjoy housework, <laughs> but it would be more, you know, when the pain starts, I'm going to go downstairs and watch a movie. So you're concentrating on a movie, a nice happy love story, nothing too stressful, no scary movies. Um, or even going to read a book, listening to music, just that it becomes an automatic cue. The minute that that pain sets in, oh, I better go watch my movie. It's not going to get rid of the pain, but remember, this is all complementary. So it's helping to add to the other things that are hopefully already in place. And it becomes a learned behavior. Mm -hmm. 
Massage is wonderful. Everybody likes massage. Massage can really help uh, promote relaxation. It can alleviate the perception of pain, alleviate, alleviate anxiety. It can increase blood flow to sore, stiff joints and muscles. Uh, and the short, sharp sensations of a good massage can temporarily make the brain forget about other sensations. So again there, this costs a little bit more than going to watch a movie on your TV. But for some people, if there's a lot, a lot of stiff muscles, massage has really been shown to be beneficial. And if you can try it, it's worth looking into. Some um, insurances do cover yeah. massage, so it's worth asking. Um, and I don't have any recommendations in terms of how often or not, because it's again an individual thing in terms of you know, what you can afford and what's helpful for you. Yoga is becoming very popular and access to yoga is better than ever because of that fact. Um, yoga is a mind-body exercise that combines both breath control, meditation, and slow fluid movements, which help with stress, which help stretch and elongate stiff and tired muscles. It can increase mobility, and there's not a lot of excess wear and tear on the body when you do it. Um, again, definitely worth trying. Even if you don't have pain, this is one of those mm -hmm. things um, with Parkinson's that has been shown to be very, mm -hmm. very helpful. Exercise and physical therapy. We all know we need to move. And like Lucy said you know, a little earlier, you have to keep moving. When you have pain, it's a lot easier said than done. But I love the example that Lucy gave you about her own back pain. It may be difficult to get your brain around the fact that I have pain when I move, but you want me to move more? That kind of doesn't make sense. But the idea is, for example, if you have a um, sore knee, you need a knee replacement, the arthritis is really bad, so you're not mobile a lot. Well, by not moving, your muscles get weaker. And what the knee needs is a really, really strong muscle below it, a really, really strong muscle above it to help support the instability that's there. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so it may you know, be difficult to get yourself going, but with time, you will see that the pain does improve with exercise. It's important though, given the Parkinson's and given the other health issues that you may have, that you consult whether it's a, a you know, kinesiologist or a physical therapist to really design a program that's suited to you so that you're not doing things that are, could be counterproductive. One thing we may add here is that it could be also passive exercise, meaning that someone could make your limb move for you if it's getting very difficult for you to move your limb or raise your shoulder, could be someone physically lifting your arm, your legs, and doing it for you. It's called passive exercise, but it would be achieving the same, the same goal here. Acupuncture is uh, an intervention consisting of insertion of tiny little needles at specific predetermined points on the body. Um, can also be done as acupressure where um, the therapist will be putting pressure points and not actually piercing the skin. There's evidence on the efficacy of acupuncture versus sham, meaning not really doing it. Uh, it's inconsistent evidence, but there are some studies that show really, really positive impact. And there's other studies that say it makes no difference. So again, it shouldn't necessarily be a first line therapy, but if you found that you've tried many, many approaches and you haven't tried this, it could be worth considering. I think you should discuss it with your healthcare provider. Um, there are other studies, like if I go back, I mentioned earlier that I did have um, some experience in multiple sclerosis before, and there was a study at one point that was done with acupuncture and bladder function. And just to say, it did help with that. So if it helped with that, then there's probably some more evidence out there that it can certainly help with pain. There's costs involved, as with mm -hmm. massage, and I couldn't find any guidelines in terms of how often it should be done or mm -hmm. after how many sessions would you expect to, to have benefit. So I think there's a little bit of research that could maybe be done even individually mm -hmm. by going to visit different practitioners on your own if that's something you're interested in. And to end up, the last two we're going to talk about herbal remedies. I don't have a list of any specific recommendations. I don't know what people are using um, for pain in terms of natural products. There's really not a lot of evidence in any of these products, not to say that they're not helpful. If we think back over the last few years, there's been a lot of talk in the news about um, glucosamine for arthritis and cartilage, and there's been conflicting reports, you know, studies that show that there's definite benefit, and then there's studies that came out to show that really it has no impact, but it's a totally safe thing to do. So it's one of those things where 
if it's safe, if you've mentioned it to your healthcare provider, we need to know what you're taking, even if it's a natural product, not because we want to lecture you that you're wasting your time or your money. We want to support you to make sure that what you're taking is not contradicting another medication or isn't potentially causing other problems. Because the bottom line is, if it's not costing you a fortune, if it's giving you benefit and it's safe, by all means, we want you to use it. Mm -hmm. Just need to let us know. Um, psychotherapy, so CBT is um, cognitive behavioral therapy. There's two different components um, to CBT. It's basically um, done by a psychologist most of the time. Uh, it's talk therapy, so you go in and you exchange. Um, and Basically, they help you relearn how you think and how your body reacts around pain. The behavioral activation component of psychotherapy, the main objective is to increase your activity levels by participating in positive and rewarding activities. So they're going to try and encourage you and talk you into maybe taking up a new hobby, which correlates with what I was talking about distraction earlier. It's kind of part distraction, but convincing yourself to do it, to take that first step and just do it. The cognitive restructuring part, this approach helps people identify unhelpful patterns of thinking and negative thoughts. So they will help you identify, for example, every time I start to have pain, I go in my room, I lie down, I turn off the lights, I don't come out. That's not really a good thing because we don't want you to be isolated. We don't want you to be just lying in bed thinking and, and ruminating about your pain. So they will help you to learn different ways to react. When the pain sets in, I get up and I do X, Y, or Z. So just that it becomes a learned behavior. So it's not this automatic shutting down, but putting new uh, things into practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess we're very at the very end of our talk, but what happened if the pain is poorly controlled or not, not controlled at all? What can it affect on our health? Of course, it will af affect our our health problem, it will worsen our quality of life for sure. It will decrease your mobility. Yeah? Your people that have pain will perhaps go, like Jennifer was saying before, go isolate themselves in their bedrooms and stay there for hours. Uh, can risk of obesity. You know, if we move less, we can increase and have obesity, and from obesity becomes other health concern. Mus muscle atrophy. If we don't use our muscle, our body or, you know, for instance, the knee example earlier, our muscle and our legs will atrophy. Depression, again, it's a vicious circle. You don't move, you don't go out, you don't talk to people, you become sad and depressed and anxious perhaps about things. And you don't sleep well. Remember the cycle of the, uh, at the beginning of the presentation, you have this on your slide. It really is a vicious circle. It's a circle, but it's a vicious circle at times. And refer to pain clinic may, is not warranted of success. So we, again, I want to say it again because, you know, people put all their energy, all their hope in the pain clinic, but really sometimes pain is a very difficult to topic to uh, deal with. The impact of the pain and on the Parkinson population, it really is from now on, if it hasn't been started before in 2016, I think, the healthcare professional we work at, we work with are very much sensi sensitized, you know, about about the pain. Uh, it interferes very much with the quality of life. We want to break the isolation, the withdrawal of the people. We want to have an impact on the motor and non-motor symptoms. You know, there is definitely an impact on the non-motor symptoms. Pain is belong to the below the iceberg surface of water but it has an impact on the mood, the depression, the sleep again, the poor nutrition. Of course, I won't have appetite if I feel so down and so much in pain. It's just, again, this vicious circle that is there. F impact on our functional decline, impact on the cognitive process. You know, you're not stimulating yourself, like today coming out here, talking to people, uh, paying attention to our, our talk. It's not what we want. We want to control the pain. We want to have a good impact on the pain. In conclusion, people with Parkinson have truly, we can truly say that there is really pain in Parkinson that exists. It could be either linked with the disease, we saw the different type of pains along with Parkinson, 
and it could also be linked with something else. And there could be two different pains, pain problem as well at the same time with the same person. So, you know, I could have arthritis in my knee and I could have musculoskeletal pain in my back because of my poor posture with Parkinson. You know, we can see that. Uh, definitely pain is a complex, multidimensional uh, problem. Eye prevalence, we saw that it's close to be half of the people with Parkinson can present pain problem. It's under-treated, under-assessed, under-treated, but we want to say that from now on, at least in our clinic, <laughs> we will try We're to trying. pay more attention. We do try to pay more attention. Uh, frankly, if I'm very, very transparent here, if we go there, and that's why on your side you have to be prepared, because if we're asking you about the pain, some physician will say we'll open a can of worms. Because you know when you start, you never know where is it going to go with the discussion. It, it could be very complex to assess the pain. So be prepared so we can do that in a timely manner, you know, because time is precious in clinic. So we all need to work together. Quality of life will be decreased if we don't take care of the pain, but we're trying to change that. Uh, require ongoing assessment, modification, treatment, and that's the goal. If we get to know about the type of pain, we'll be able to manage your pain better. Speak up, be heard. This is in bold letter here. That means you need to address the pain. Even if you really think it has nothing to do with your Parkinson, speak about it. We might refer you to another professional, another healthcare professional, a gastroenterologist if it's a stomach thing, a urologist if it has to do with your bladder and so on and so forth. Maybe you have other ideas, but, and of course with the pain clinic if it's appropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So just to, to tell you again about the question, I, I think it's gonna be very difficult for Jennifer and I to answer specific question if you raise your hand and you have a specific back problem or back ache. However, what we propose to do is making you reflect on perhaps the PQRST we saw in our presentation. So you'll be able to tell your healthcare professional about your pain, if it's that okay with you. Oh, I know. Oh, under, I know under. <laughs> Hello, hello. Yes. So we'll start with the first question here. Euh, moi, j'ai une question par rapport à la gestion de la douleur. Oui. Vous avez mentionné euh, beaucoup de médications là, mais vous n'avez pas mentionné du tout la cortisone. Alors, je voudrais savoir pour un problème des hernies discales ou le qui pourrait être associé à, au Parkinson, est-ce que vous qu'est-ce que vous pensez de l'infiltration de la cortisone? Uh, je, je vais répondre le, le plus. Uh, do you want to say in English first what's the question? Okay, we'll yes, answer. I'll repeat in English. So she was uh, asking about when we were talking about pain, um, we didn't mention anything about cortisone uh, injections and what we think about that. Fait que pour répondre en français. Um, oh non, non, je vais faire les deux, c'est correct. Ça me fait pratiquer en tout cas. <laughs> um, J'ai mentionné qu'il y avait des injections qu'on pourrait faire. Fait qu'il y a des, des injections de cortisone, puis il y a des injections aussi euh, euh, comme... Euh, des blocker, um, nerve block. Des euh, anesthétiques Anesthetic. pour mm -hmm. arrêter les douleurs. C'est pas quelque chose qui est fait par des neurologues dans les cliniques de troubles de mouvement. Ça serait référé soit à une clinique de douleur ou à euh, une orthopédie. Des fois, mm -hmm. ils vont le faire. Fait qu'on peut vous aider pour vous donner la demande de consultation. C'est eux autres qui vont décider si c'est approprié dans votre cas ou non. Parce que euh, une hernie discale, c'est pas tout à fait un effet de Parkinson, mm -hmm. mais plutôt l'âge. Est-ce que ça répond un peu? Est-ce que ça pourrait être associé aussi à, à, au Parkinson? Pas directement. Pas directement. No. So to summarize how I answered, um, when I was mentioning throughout the talk about injections for pain, I, was, I mentioned Botox and I mentioned nerve blocks. 
Cortisone is another form of injection that can help to uh, reduce pain in a specific joint uh, or within the back because it's a strong anti-inflammatory. It's not something that the physician, the neurologist in the movement disorder clinic will do. Um, we refer it out. It can either be, sometimes it's a, a neurosurgeon, yeah. physiatrist, mm -hmm. uh, uh, orthopedics, and they would assess and decide if it's appropriate or not for your pain. But that, that type of pain is not, um, 100% caused, caused by, by Parkinson. Parkinson, it's more age-related changes. Mm -hmm. It's a very good question because we see it so often. Oui. We see that very often. Mm -hmm. There's a question in the back there. There was, wasn't any mention about marijuana as a, ah. um, another type of therapy. It's because we don't have and, um, would the uh, neurologist consider writing a prescription for it since it's a non-pharmacological yeah. yeah. uh, therapy? So it's a very good question, the question about marijuana to help relieve pain. Uh, to tell you the truth, we've done it. However, in our clinic, some neurologists are comfortable and some neurologists are not comfortable. So it's really, you know, whoever you're dealing with, uh, of course, marijuana is more, the, the evidence about marijuana is more about oncology. Pain regarding a cancer, oncology treatment, there is no wrong there. The, you know, the, the oncologist will perhaps, if the pain is not controlled in any other way, they will refer you to, uh, there is an association, it's medical marijuana. There's a form we need to fill. This doctor that I refer to, we fill a form. It's not up to him to prescribe it, the, the, the dosage, the number of milligram, the, you know, one joint, two joint, and one day, this is not the way it's been done. He refer the person to this medical uh, directive uh, association, Marimana Quebec, and uh, they are the one assessing the person based on the problem, Parkinson versus cancer versus something else. And based on that, it's gonna happen. And I'd just like to add as well, um, we didn't bring it up because there, it really there isn't no. clear guidelines in Parkinson's pain and the use of it. We do get asked often, um, but one answer that we did receive once and that we've uh, heard is that it's not always ideal in Parkinson's patients because long-term use of marijuana can affect cognitive functioning. And so sometimes that could be a reason why we wouldn't want to go there as well. Yes. You seem to be addressing mostly the musculoskeletal pain. How would you differentiate in a situation where it's, I don't know if you would call it pain, but organic discomfort? Like what would be the difference between pain and discomfort when it's more, let's say, um, a digestive issue or where they're not sure exactly what it is, but it's not the type of intense pain or acute pain that you were referring to? So it, that that's, you know, a great example of how it can be very difficult and very tricky and trying to use the PQRST to try and help isolate it because, you know, if, it, if you think it's gastric, we might say, well, we, maybe you need to go see a gastroenterologist. Maybe they need to do a scope and see, are there ulcers? Is it a muscle problem? Is it really mm -hmm. the stomach? Like it, it gets very difficult. So in terms of trying to get, you know, better at documenting, having a little diary. Oh, there's pain. What time of day is it? Mark it down. Did he just eat? Did he not eat? Uh, what makes the pain worse? What makes it better? Is it a cycle? Is it happening at the same time every day? Is it always stomach pain? Is it pain that goes everywhere? I mean, I think those are the, the answers that we would need to have to really be able to give you a better answer. And in terms of discomfort versus pain, remember the definition at the beginning? Pain is an uncomfortable sensation. So what might be discomfort to one person might be severe pain to somebody mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. So if it's discomfort, I would consider it pain and worth mentioning. Hang, hang on, we need the microphone to you. Yeah. Something that you mentioned in your introduction, which was interesting to hear, that there is a greater occurrence of uh, Parkinson's in the Americas and Europe as opposed to Africa and Asia. Correct. Does that sort of continue that notion that it might be environmental as absolutely, opposed to? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the cause of Parkinson are still uh, unknown, but there's, it's a multi-causal factor. You know, 
when I started in Parkinson in 2001, frankly, we were telling our, our patient, in 10 years, we're going to have a cure. I remember saying that myself. And of course, we're 15 years later now. And of course, we never say that to our patient anymore. The problem is the research has gone that way. It's not narrow. Research is very large. And what we've known now is that it's a multi-causal factor. So if I'm giving you an example about a gun, the gun, it's very strong image, but I want you to understand that the gun is your hereditary, all your genes, your build, you know, the way you've, you've built. Something, the target of my gun is the environment. So something in the environment that you come across one day will make it happen, will make it having a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. So there is about 15, perhaps even more genes that can give Parkinson's disease now. And yes, to go back to the country who have less Parkinson's disease, your hypothesis is as good as mine. Cultural, the type of food they eat, the pollution, the climate. You know, there's a lot of things we could look when we're doing those research in different countries. We cannot pinpoint yet what it is, but it's multicausal. It's not just one thing, it's multicausal. It's genetic environmental factor, the two together. Okay? Somebody else? In oh, at the front, the microphone at the front. It's coming. Hang in there. <laughs> I don't really like speaking up, but I'll okay. speak up because I know how annoying it is when you can't hear it. Um, I have a terrible, like a terrible pain in the top of my foot. Uh, I thought it was, a nurse thought it was arthritis, but then the doctor said, I'm just asking this for, the doctor said that uh, it was inconclusive, the results from the ultrasound were inconclusive, and they told her to go by how the patient feels. Well, this patient is getting fed up with this pain, <laughs> and at night in the tiredness, like you said, the vicious circle occurs, all those symptoms, uh, symptoms or feelings that you get make it worse at night. And, and then in my worst moment, I get worried that it could be cancer. Mm. So, but, so no one, I guess not knowing what the heck this is, is starting to wear at me and I'm looking for answers, please. So the question is, what can you comment on that? Well, it's, as we said, that it's very difficult. I mean, we could, we could help you to Try to get some answers in terms of the PQRST. Yeah. Okay, so what's provoking? Is it always there? Is it from the moment you wake up, the moment you go to bed? P, that's the P. Q, the quality of the pain. Is it burning, stabbing, you know, try to, yes, to name yes, it. it is. Okay, Q, R, the, the uh, what's the heart now? I forgot. The region. The region, <laughs> of course we know it's the feet. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh about the pain. I mean, no, this is a very serious topic. But no, I understand yeah. you. So the, the, the region is the toe, but then again, is it one toe? Is it the whole feet? Is it the, you know, the top? Like we need to be specific about the location. R, S, the severity from one to 10. And again, is it at the worst? When is the worst? Is it a specific time of the day? And when it's not so bad, what is it? What's the score? The zero to or one to ten or one uh, zero to ten. And uh, T, the timing. How is long? it you, if you have Parkinson? Is it always there? Is it when your medication wears off? Because if it is, one way to look at your pain is to adjust your Parkinson medication. There's nothing wrong with trying to do that. If you're telling us, you know, it's always at night, when I go to bed, I get those cramping toes. I'm just gonna give another bit of an example. Cramping toes, and it's yeah. when I go to bed, well, maybe you need something at bedtime in terms of Parkinson medication. It's just, you know, a, a very... Sorry, you don't have the microphone now. <laughs> so because it's being taped, that's why I'm insisting about the microphone. I'm so sorry. Maybe uh, we can take another question in the meantime. Sure, sure, sure. What do you think of going to see a chiropractor? I'm, not sure. I'm sorry, can you? What, what do you think about going to see a chiropractor? 
So I, I didn't mention chiropractor on there, but some people do find relief. Again, I think um, anytime there's pain that's new, should always be assessed by whether it's your neurologist or your family physician first. Chiropractors, um, in some patients, they get some relief if it's a, a posture or, or bone alignment thing. Um, but you don't want to do any damage if there's you know pain because there's some kind of pathology going on in a specific joint or, or bone. I think it's good to start with the traditional first. Um, so I don't really have a whole lot of information on it other than if you go to someone who's reputable and you've ruled out, you know, a specific pathology or or something wrong with the bone or the joint itself, it could be something worth looking into. Sorry, I don't have more information than that. I've been taking my pills with my food, which my pharmacist kept said that I should be doing, Mm -hmm. but now the doctor said that I should take it before I eat, a half an hour before. When should I take the pill? Should I take it before? Should I take it with food? It's a very good point. I'm glad you're addressing this because we have, whoops. (laughs) Sometimes we tell our patients up front when they're newly diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, take your medication with food to avoid those stomach feeling, queasy stomach, nausea, with the, the adjusting to those new pills, we're gonna say take it with food. However, when the disease progress, when we're trying to get a better absorption of those pills, we might change our mind in telling you, the pharmacist did, take your pills on an empty stomach because they're gonna be absorbed quicker and you're gonna have perhaps a better result. If you take it with food, there will be perhaps a you know, competition with the food you take, but eventually the pill will be absorbed. I don't want you to go, to go and change your habit today after we leave this room, but whatever you're doing, if you're feeling okay about it, with or without food, if you, food, if you don't have side effect, if you, you're okay with your stomach, there's no problem. But that's why sometimes we change our way of saying things, even the pharmacists are um, saying different things sometimes. Initially, with food to avoid the side effect, later on it could be before the food, Uh okay? Okay, thank you. Hi, um, if somebody believes they have Parkinson's disease, what is the best way to receive a diagnosis? And once they've received that diagnosis, what can they expect? It's kind of a broad question, so I'll give kind of a broad answer. Um, There's no specific test that can be done to say you have Parkinson's or you don't. It's a clinical diagnosis. So based on um, the clinical presentation, what the doctor sees, what the doctor feels when they're making you move your muscles and your joints, what you report you feel, uh, and, and by ruling out a series of other possible causes Mm -hmm. Um, so it's difficult sometimes to get a diagnosis on a first visit sometimes people will be seen by their family doctor who because they see the tremor the tremor you know can be one of the more identifiable features which may or may not be parkinson's but it's it's often one of the easier things to say hey i think this this could be Um, so a gp could basically suspect that there's Parkinson's and they may be able to diagnose it. But if there is a a suspected, the Canadian guidelines recommend that um, people should be seen by a neurologist to help confirm the diagnosis, then they could be managed by a a family physician afterwards. But to confirm the diagnosis, it would be best to see a a neurologist. And again, there, it may not be that first visit. It may be, well, we think it is, here's the medication, try it, we're gonna see you again in two or three months, see if there's Mm -hmm. changes and over time it gets confirmed. Does that answer? So we still have time for two or three questions, so raise your hand if you want to uh, ask uh, Lucy and Jennifer a question. I can raise my hand. hand. Yeah. One at the far end of the room. (laughs) Danielle, we have another one here after, in the front. Um, you talked about dystonia, but what about dyskinesia? Is that related somehow or other, or, or dyskinesia can also be painful? Dyskinesia can, is uh, specific in regards to the medication. Okay, so it's not, uh, well, dyskinesia can bring pain, I, I give it to you, but 
dyskinesia is could be happening at two times and dyskinesia for people who don't know it's a involuntary movement totally different than tremor i could be here talking to you and i could have little waves like this in my body this is dyskinesia it could be the you know the face that moves the twitching of you know so i could be moving like this it happened in two times it could happen peak dose of the levodopa when the it's like too much happening in the brain at once you know it's a question of absorption or again it could present when you're wearing off your symptoms return and you can have wearing off the skin easier okay yeah, and yes the, i think that probably a, what we've seen is some of the pain that can be associated with dyskinesia is actually musculoskeletal pain mm -hmm. because of this constant movement. It's like you're constantly working out, and so that's where the pain often comes from. So we didn't isolate it, but it's a very good point. Thank you for bringing it up. Yes, sir. Yes, I'd like to know. I, I have been diagnosed with, with Parkinson's 10 years ago. I have no shakes. Mm -hmm. The only I have sometime, like now I'm... I, I can't walk anymore. You're rigid. M mostly on on the right, f the right knee area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yes. Yep. So there's different types of Parkinson's. There's the tremor predominant, which is what we were mentioning before, where you have the the shaking, and then you have uh, a kinetic rigid type of Parkinson's, which is less easily identifiable to people that see you, but it it is Parkinson's as well. Yeah. I keep encouraging him to use the walker as much as possible. I don't know if I'm doing right or wrong, but I, I push a little bit. You know, it, it's very difficult. I mean, that, this, this is not really a, a question. It's more a comment. I get, I get you. <laughs> However, if to your point, if it's bringing you peace of mind that is no less at risk of falling with the walker, I understand your point of view. For his point of view, I'm saying perhaps he feels still capable of walking by himself without the walker. So he wants to postpone the walk. No. I don't go, I don't go anywhere without the walker. Okay, so that's good then. You both agree. <laughs> you both agree that he needs the walker. <laughs> sure. Other than that, he's in a wheelchair. Sure. Mm -hmm. So I'm encouraging yeah. to use the walker as much as possible. Sure, yeah. the walker is important. Yeah. Anybody okay. else? Is there one last question before we wrap it up? Well, it was really two questions. One, it was I was kind of uh, disappointed that you couldn't really tell me if my pain is Parkinson's or not. That's number one. And number two, it brought to mind about this walker business. I'm, when I stand, and I kind of a bit off balance. But my concern is sometimes dizziness. But everybody and anybody, nursing people, they always bugging me about this walker business. And I don't really want to have a walker, and I want to be as independent as possible. It actually depresses me and puts me more strain on me when I have to think about the walker business again. Mm -hmm. So I want you to, I would like your comment, please. Sure. I, I'll answer the first half and maybe you can answer sure. the second. So the first question, if I, I'm getting it correctly, is that you were disappointed about us not being able to help you um, decipher if it's Parkinson's pain or not. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, that's the reality of pain. And a lot of times it can be a combination. The other thing is, I mean, we're here to give information, try and help you learn how to report it, but we're not physicians, so we can't really diagnose your pain it's kind of not the appropriate um, platform for that but hopefully you know the PQRST the other um, consultations you've had for pain already trying to remember what has helped before what makes it worse I mean it's a process of elimination and if you think of you know how long you've had pain it's probably going to take a long time to eventually get rid of it too it's it's often one of those things that just takes a lot of patience trial and error but don't give up speak up and be heard and hopefully eventually mm -hmm. it'll get there for the walker just to finish up the, <laughs> the answer uh it, you know you have you know i keep telling my my patient if there's a risk of fall i guess if the healthcare providers with you fig thinks you have a risk of falls of course they will encourage you to use a walker uh, you know and it's your right to refuse to use a walker I guess that, that's the end of the... Yeah.
but you uh, you acknowledge the risk. That's all. I, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> I think just, everybody does I that. Didn't <laughs> Oh. Okay, one last. Okay. Okay. One last question. Yes, sir. Okay. Is uh, tardive dyskinesia related to Parkinson's uh, dyskinesia? Or? Tardive dyskinesia is a disease. I'm sorry. The microphone. Tardive dyskinesia is a disease by itself. It's. It may or may not be related to Parkinson's disease. That's a, it's a diagnosis by itself, done by neurologists who assess a person. It, this usually comes from um, different medication that were used in the past that could predispose the person to have those involuntary movement. It would be a side, a long-term side effect of medication, not necessarily related to Parkinson, but it, it could come. I don't I hope I'm I'm clear. Okay. Thank you everyone. These were great questions. We'll have to wrap up. <laughs> finish off one ultimate question here. That's the very last cuz we have to move on, but I while you wait for the microphone, I take this opportunity to say that if you enjoy hearing from one another, exchanging experience and providing support. We've got four English speaking support groups. You're welcome to join. You can get the information at the Parkinson's table in the, uh, in the hallway. So we'll go with one last question before, uh, before we wrap it up. Actually, it's not, a qu it's not a question. I'm a physiotherapist and I just wanted to comment on the walker situation oh. here. <laughs> please, Perha please. <laughs> Perhaps it would be beneficial for, because people are very resistant, and I understand the stigma or whatever people are feeling, mm -hmm. they don't want to use a walker. But we, as physiotherapists, do have evaluations, tests, that determine who is at risk of falls, what the potential is, what the score is, you know, what the risk is, and perhaps if you undergo that type of evaluation, that will help you determine or convince you that maybe in a, a walker is it appropriate for your safety. Thank you. Thank you very much for that information. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that if you have not a copy already, you can grab a handout of all the slides that were presented to you today. They're on the table in the hallway. And uh, please fill out those evaluation sheets and join me in thanking Lucy Lachance and Jennifer Doran for such a great Thank presentation. You. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the Cummings Centers in Parkinson's Canada will be working and organizing future events like this one. So please leave us your contact information to be informed of upcoming activities. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Thank